Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 316 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I am so pleased that you are here with me today as we are talking to Sarah McCraw Crow. And it was so fun to talk to her. And we talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world, shiny object syndrome and what to do with that feeling. So that's coming up uh, just after this personal update, which is Yay. That's there. There. That's all. I could just, I could just go on, but I won't. Um, I will tell you that I am home from writing retreat and oh my God. Oh my God, y'all. Oh my God. If you follow me on TikTok, um, you can see a little video that I filmed while I was there. It was called The Nest and it was kind of a tiny home. It was one big room with a bed and a little table and a tiny, tiny, tiny little kitchen. And glass all around it just you know the kiwis do really well with having just walls made of glass the sliding glass doors that are you know triple deep that you could just keep sliding and keep opening the walls and it opened out onto the ocean the tasman sea right there and it was nestled in and on this dairy farm it probably, I had to borrow their utility vehicle, therefore we'll drive in order to get out to this place because my car would not have made it through the mud and the dips and the ruts of the dairy farm. And when I got there, it was storming so hard. It was storming so much uh, that it was actually kind of a little bit terrifying. There was a, there was, this is why I rented it. There was a bathtub outside that looked over the pastures and the sea and it was incredible but when I got there winds were like 90 knots an hour so it was uh 90 knots an hour are knots measured in an hour anyway it was about 85 to 90 knots it was just really really strong which is incredibly strong and I kind of have a, a bit of fear around wind and after having lived through a super typhoon when I was a teenager and as I was moving my stuff from the utility vehicle into the building there were two times when I almost couldn't hold myself up against the wind it was trying to blow me over which is fine that happens in Wellington the windiest city in the world uh however this Again, another lovely Kiwi thing is that they just trust you to keep yourself safe, but at the edge of the deck was a cliff that went straight down to the ocean. So um, just getting into the nest was a little bit, felt a little bit treacherous. And that night there was, the storm just continued to rage and the building was so small and so far away from anything else. Uh, and the wind shook it. It shook it so that the floor constantly was going and the bed I was sitting on just shaking the couch shaking the table chairs shaking constantly all night and uh and I was terrified I was I was terrified that the whole thing would be ripped off and thrust into the Tasman Sea I was also not terrified. I knew that my brain was overreacting I knew that my body was having uh visceral and somatic memory happening to it. And I was able to just kind of embrace the fear and sit with that discomfort and go, oh, this does not feel very good, but it is very exciting. It is very exciting. I had just enough cell reception. There was no Wi-Fi, but there was just enough cell reception that I could communicate with my wife and my sisters on Marco Polo. So I kept sending them probably terrifying updates. Like I'm still here. The nest is not blown into the ocean. Uh, so that was great. And <laughs> Honestly, the only way I could sleep that night as the bed literally shook was to tell myself that I was on a train. I decided to tell myself that I was on a train and that this was a sleeping car and that we were rolling across landscape that was a little bit bumpy. And I honestly slept. I really did. I kept waking up and going, oh crap. But then I would fall back asleep again. And the next day it was rainy, but I did go out in the tub and more wind, but by then I knew the place wouldn't blow away and the winds were much decreased. The storm had mostly passed. And I spent three nights there. And all I did, y'all, was journal and read books and eat food and take baths and sleep. Those were the only things I did. I had I brought my revision um, that I'm doing, but I had already planned out in my schedule 
what that would look like if I didn't revise at all while I was there, because I have a proven track record. When I go on retreat or on any kind of um, trip at all, I basically don't write no matter how much I tell myself I will. So I had already jiggered my schedule so that that would work. And I certainly, that, that happened. I brought my computer. It never opened, not even once. And in fact, that became a point of pride by the end of the retreat. And I came back having thought so deeply about what I want to do, what I want to write, what I want to do next. And I came back feeling so refreshed. And I also came back feeling so much gratitude for you all and how you let me show up and talk into your ears about writing. And I want to do, I want to keep bolstering that relationship. I have been, I'll talk more about this as we move forward. And I had a great conversation with Sasha Black, which is going to be on the Patreon um, soon. But I've always battled myself a little bit um, or a lot a bit with, you know, am I a writer if I'm teaching? If I'm, if I'm, how, how should I balance those two things? You know, can I write and teach? Y'all, I just love teaching. And that struck me in the last couple of weeks. It has struck me so dang hard. I will never stop writing books. I will always be writing books, but I had had this goal to make enough money by writing books to get myself out of the teaching. And then I just realized recently, why would I want to do that? I love it. I love talking about writing. I love doing this podcast. I light up when I talk about writing. It is my favorite thing in the whole world. So anyway, I'm going to be doing that. So in honor of that, I have actually rejiggered my Patreon levels over at patreon.com slash Rachel um, with a couple more writerly goodies over there. So you may want to check that out. Um, also, I am going to do a couple of things every week and, you know, I, I change my process all the time and I may change away from it if it doesn't, if I don't like how it feels or if it doesn't go well. But what I want to do right now is um, thank somebody who left a review for my show over on uh, Apple Podcasts, which is where most of you all listen, that and Spotify. Although I don't know if you can leave a written review at Spotify. I should check into that. Um, but this person, Shan in SoCal said uh, a couple weeks ago, um, one of my favorites, I am a huge fan of the How Do You Write podcast. I'm fascinated by process and how people do things to get where they need to go. I like the host style of delivery, <laughs> delivery, see how that delivery went, and speaking voice and have greatly enjoyed the variety of guests that she's had on the show. I have found quite a few new to me authors and books through these interviews too. Thank you. Thank you, Shan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I love getting those kinds of reviews or any reviews at all. They make me deliriously happy. So if you ever want to leave me one, I would love it. And maybe I will read it on the show. And I have decided that I want to give away more stuff because that's what I like to do. I like to give away stuff. And what do we do around here? We read and we write and we read and we read some more. And I read so many books while I was gone. I read four or five books while I was there. I just keep remembering ones that I... I also finished while I was there. That's really all I did. Um, but one of them that I read was David Ellis. Um, he and I actually share an agent. And I read the book because my agent sent me a copy, a hard copy, copy of his book, All the Way to New Zealand, and said, I think you'll love it. And I loved it so much. I'm trying to get him on the show. Uh, his book is called Look Closer. It is a thriller. And you know how thrillers always brag on the cover that they're twisty and, oh, you'll never see this coming. I enjoyed the twists and those surprises in this book so much. And I thought they were so well done and masterfully handled and I couldn't put the thing down. So David Ellis, look closer. I would like to recommend that highly. And like I said, I'm going to give the book away. I might do this every week. I might do it every week every other week, not sure yet, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to randomly pull names from either my Patreon supporter list or my email newsletter list. Um, the Patreon list, you can go get cool stuff or for absolutely free, you can get on the newsletter list and be one of the people that I might pull your name. So right now I'm going to pull the name Jody J. Nelson. Jody, please hit me up. Tell me that you won David Ellis's book and I will send it to you in your format of choice. So, um, I am proceeding with the developmental edit of Seven Miracles and still really enjoying it. It's so, it's so much fun. It's the, it's the delicious time, as I have mentioned. And um, I should be done with that in a week and a half 
according to my schedule. And then it will go off to the copy editor and also to my agent who is probably going to take it out as well. And um, we'll see how that goes and I will keep you all posted on that. But I am proceeding forward. I am moving forward as if I am going to self-publish this. And we'll see if anything diverts me from that path. Uh, but that's how we are going right now. So soon it will be off with the copy editor. And um, yeah, I'm just having a lot of fun with it. And and really have reached the point in this book in Seven Miracles where I care about the characters so much, which is great because in a first draft, I pretty much can't stand any of them normally. They're very, very flat to me in a first draft. Uh, my characters don't really start coming alive until the second draft and sometimes not even until the third draft. So uh, yeah, it's just, it's just going awesome. And that is all the updates that I think we need around here. Let me give you a little bit of a bio for Sarah. Sarah McCraw Crow is the author of the novel, The Wrong Kind of Woman from Mira HarperCollins. Her short fiction has run in Calix, Crab Orchard Review, Good Housekeeping, and Stanford Alumni Magazine. And she's a regular book reviewer for BookPage. She's a graduate of Dartmouth College, Stanford University, and the Vermont College of Fine Arts, where she got her MFA. And she lives with her family on an old farm in New Hampshire, which I think is just such a romantic sentence. So please enjoy this interview. Please be thinking about how and where you can get your own writing done. And then please find me somewhere where I am online. Uh, most of the time lately, it's on TikTok. And tell me how it's going because I really, really want to know. All right. Happy writing, my friends. All right. Well, I could not be more pleased to welcome to you, you to the show. It feels like it's been a long time coming that we've been trying to get here. Can you share your name with us and your pronouns? So my name is Sarah McCraw Crow. My pronouns are she, her. Thank and you so thank much. You. <laughs> I am so excited to talk to you about this gorgeous book and your writing. Um, and The Wrong Kind of Woman is, I'll just tell you really quickly, I'll uh, fangirl a little bit early that I do get a lot of books from publishers and they end up on my Kindle and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have this person on the show and then I should, you know, read the book. But then sometimes I forget when people are coming on and I just grab a book out of my Kindle that's been sitting there and I start to read it. And I had forgotten that this was your book that you were, <laughs> because I just opened it without really looking at anything. And I just started reading and I loved it. And then I was so excited when I, oh, it's Sarah's book and we're going to be chatting. So Aww. how are you feeling about this being out in the world? This is your debut. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's been kind of a long time coming because I've had other novels as many of us have that didn't sell. So it, it feels really nice. And debuting in a pandemic is a little bit strange, yeah. but I had a lot of um, debut author friends that, you know, we connected online and that was a, such a huge help and made it a lot more fun too. How did you find those um, debut? Through well, your publisher or? No, actually someone who had been through the process before it might have been Karen Ducasse. I, I don't remember who it was, said, look on Facebook and find debut 2020. And um, so I did. And that that's a group of oh, maybe, cool. you know, every year people join a traditionally published um, debut authors. And so it's kind of like a support group. It's, it's really, it's super helpful. I think that um, is so important to be with your peers and with your peers at the point of the journey that you all are sharing. I think mm -hmm. it is so, so, so cool. Talk to us a little bit about those other books. Did you have an agent take books out that just didn't sell? So, okay. So uh, the first couple were just the novels in the drawer that yeah. were never going to, and I didn't even query with those. Those are just the ones you like put away, um, probably two and a half of those, I would say. Um, and then the novel that got me an agent was a historical novel about the sister and the family of the artist, John Singer Sargent. Mm -hmm. So very different than The Wrong yeah. Kind of Woman because it was set sort of Gilded Age Edwardian times and mm -hmm. mostly in London and Paris. So completely different. And the feedback, as you know, the feedback that comes from editors is very um, complimentary, um, but no takers. And the it was too quiet, too quiet. And... So that was, that was that, but while that was out, I started this other project, which turned out to be the wrong kind of woman. And it was such a pleasure to be in the 20th century, yeah. you know, to not have to research every little detail. 
So that's, that's fabulous. I love, I, I love hearing that. Do you think you'll get out the, uh, that book anytime in the future or is it shelved well, for now? It's shelved for now. I, I mean, yeah. I see now why nobody was, was buying it and I still feel very fond of it. And I, I do wonder if I could somehow at some point pull it apart and start again. And, um, but the thing is, I'm not really a historical fiction person. Mm. I do read it sometimes, but it's not where I don't know that that's where my, I, I if I'm historical, it's more like the sixties and the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. So, which yeah. counts as historical these days. It, that hurts so, my brain. I don't I like know. it and it's true. And yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, talk to us a little bit about your writing process. When and how, how do you get it all done? So my writing process has changed over the years. And at this point, I'm really an early morning writer. Um, try to do that first thing, which get my coffee. Don't, uh, you know, check the news or Twitter or whatever, uh, Wordle or whatever. And just go right to the notebook or right to the laptop and start writing before I'm really thinking. Um, also, I think if I'm just starting a project, I usually like to start on the paper, like pen and paper feels like less of a commitment and you can just be kind of, it kind of doesn't matter what you're writing. So you can just write. And there's something for me about the screen. Um, I mean, I do write and do everything on the screen, but there's just something about when you're starting to write fiction that a notebook feels just easier somehow. The words just kind of come out more more easily so that's how I usually start um and Lila is joining us our dog um hello Lila <laughs> and we have a puppy in the room too and you might hear some the, squeaky toys yes, and I love that yes I love that. He's, he loves his squeaky toys um <laughs> so yeah so I'm mostly an early morning person but I I used to be like when the kids were younger I really didn't have very much time to do you know parenting and my regular writing or more nonfiction writing and the fiction. So I would just squeeze it in wherever. And that would be like in the car when somebody was at hockey practice or in when somebody was at the, at their piano lessons or something like that. And I do think there's something to be said, and I'm sure this has come up on your podcast for being able to just write wherever you are and whenever you are and not be tied to one time a day one pattern and I have gotten myself into that pattern. I'm like, if I don't get it done by nine o'clock, I'm like, oh, well, guess I'm not gonna write. Day's today. over, gonna, right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not very productive. There, There is a certain kind of superpower I think that comes with that. And I find that writing mothers tend to learn that really well and how to, how to fit it in. But I am exactly like you. If I, if I miss my most productive hours, I'm just like, okay, guess I'll see you tomorrow book. <laughs> You know? And I know that's I know. not true. I could put it in anywhere, but that, that really does yeah. get stuck in our head. So when do you, when do you know that it's time to leave the notebook and go into the computer? And does the notebook stay with you as you work through a book? Oh, that's right. a good question. Yeah. Um, the notebook, when I've gotten to a certain amount of pages and I kind of know who a character is, then I switch to a document, a word document. Mm -hmm. And the notebook does stay with me. And I, I actually have a couple, like for this project that I'm working on now that is still kind of a big mush. I have a couple different no, uh, notebooks. One notebook is like this small little thing that I don't, I put weird stuff in there. And then the other one is more like a real, you know, <laughs> high school, college notebook or whatever. Yeah. I can't really tell you what the difference is between those two things, but one means something and one means something else. But so I do go back and forth. I actually have been going back and forth more this time between the screen and the page, the piece of paper. It helps me so, a lot when I remember to, to, to mix it up, like, oh, I'm stuck. Okay. Go to the, go to the pen, go to, am I getting it right? When I guess that one of the notebooks is, um, maybe less pressure, like is one just kind of yeah. like anything rambling, jotting, screaming. And then the other one is more thinking. And then you get to the computer. I think it is like that. Yes. And although I would say I keep kind of jumping back and forth and complicating that is I keep putting in little mini scenes of another novel that doesn't exist yet, which is one of my problems, <laughs> you know, distraction. Um, so, but I feel like that's a safe place to put it. It doesn't matter. I yeah. can just put it in there. It'll be there if I want to come back to it. If I don't, it's just something else on the page. 
I do love going back through a notebook and, and seeing all of the fantastic ideas that I had and then completely forgot. Like, how could I have forgotten? I'd already solved this particular problem and it just yes. you know didn't exist until you look back at the page. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Oh, challenges. Okay. I actually have, I do have a lot of challenges, but I would say um, my two, I have two probably biggest challenges. And one is the problem of self-editing before it's time. So like mm. I go back and look at what I've written, like maybe what I wrote the day before, which is not necessarily a bad thing, except I start tinkering with sentences mm. and making it nice. And I think for some writers, that probably is the way to proceed. But I think for me, I'm not Lauren Groff or whoever. I can't make like, you know, the perfect first section and then move on. I need to just move forward. So um, that's a, that's something I do need to work on. And I, over and over, I find myself going backwards instead of forwards. So that's a challenge. And then my other challenge, I think I have mentioned this a little earlier, um, is getting distracted by other novel ideas. And actually, I think that's how I first connected with you because I heard on the podcast, you talked about shiny object syndrome. And I don't know if that was just like a passing thing and you never said it again, but I was like, I have shiny object syndrome. That's what I have. And so other novel ideas will appear to me and I will start going down the rabbit hole, even though I have no business going down the rabbit hole with some other novel idea. I mean, the good news is that the novels the ideas keep coming, but I think it's just another way of procrastinating. And we all have those, yeah. those things we do. It's yeah. that, that's one of those levels of essential pain when we realize that it is a form of procrastination. Um, and it is such a juicy, delicious form of procrastination. What Elizabeth Gilbert, I think calls it the, the slutty idea that, you know, you're making out within the bathroom when you shouldn't be. And yeah, it's, totally. you know, sexy and fun. And yeah. so, so how do you, how do you manage that? Do you just capture them and then hope that they get out of your head or? That's a good question. I mean, I think one thing for me is to just make the internet not available. So I can't yeah. quickly like Google whoever, some interesting <laughs> artist from the forties or whatever. No. Um, so that is one thing. And the other is like in the notebook that has all the stuff in it to like, let myself write a little something down and then say, it's, it's there. I can come back to it and That's now safe. go back to my, yeah. And I suppose for, I mean, you've written many, many novels and for people who are more, who have many more novels under the belt, you probably know at a certain point when something is uh, kind of talking to you and that you need to follow that and let, put the, put this project down and go follow that other thing. And I don't have that sense yet. I, I don't think I have that sense yet either. I think for me, and I know it's different for everybody, but I, I just have to stick to the book that I'm on and finish it. Otherwise there will always be a fantastic fantastic, perfect idea that I haven't spoiled yet, you know, and that's always going to yes. be easier than, than finishing this damn book that whatever it is yes. that I'm writing. Yeah. What is your so biggest true. joy when it comes to biggest writing? Biggest joy. Yeah. Well, one joy is it really, it's a very small joy, but it's something that amazes me every time. Okay. So if I'm having trouble with a scene or with a character or with a plot point, you know, how do I get these two characters together or time is wrong, whatever I can take myself on a walk especially if it's a trail walk and ask myself a, the question at the beginning of the walk, like what would Charlie do in this situation? Take my walk. And at the end of the walk, more often than not, an answer will present itself. And it's not like I've been like stewing over it. It's, it's just, if I walk without a podcast or music or whatever, it just comes to me. And it's like a little miracle. And that's not even like when I'm sitting at the I know that's not really writing and yet it sort of is writing. It is writing. And you're kind of blowing my mind because I do this quite a bit when I go to sleep, but I have a complicated relationship with sleep period. So, Don't and I, but I know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially the thinkers among us. I really, I do believe mm -hmm. that, but I love asking myself the question and then waking up to find sometimes that the, oftentimes that the answer is there, but I haven't ever thought about doing it like actually on before a trail walk, cause I've been doing a lot more trail walking here. And it sounds like almost a, a beautiful kind of meditation on, on writing, like a, almost a commitment to writing, like ask the question, wait for the answer. Don't really think too hard about it. Let it come. 
Yeah. And because my, when I'm on a walk like that, I'm not typically thinking about the problem. I'm just letting mm-hmm. my mind wander. Yeah. I mean, I do find if I'm listening to a podcast or news or a playlist or something, it doesn't really work. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I do think our subconscious, our subconsciousnesses are working on I absolutely believe all it. the time. So. I absolutely believe it. And also my ADHD brain is like, oh, I need a podcast. So how could I possibly walk without <laughs> so that? <true. laughs> that is so true. Yes. <laughs> now, will you share a craft tip with us? And I know that this one is a, an interesting, complex one. So walk us through this. Okay. So this is more of a, I would call this a generative or a writing prompt. Like a prompt. Kind of, yeah. Like a prompt. So I recently read Julie Otsuka's book, the swimmers. It's a novel, or maybe it's a novella. It's in um, two parts. The first part is about a group of swimmers who are coping with the fact that their pool is got a crack in it and it's closing. And there really aren't any scenes in this novel. It's all lists. It's the craziest thing, but it's, she's a wonderful writer. Then the second part is about one of the swimmers. Her name is Alice and she has a dementia and she's sort of in the middle stage of dementia and it's kind of from the point of view of her daughter who feels very guilty um but it's just it's a very meditative section and when i read um some of this it made me think oh you could take this and make it into your own kind of prompt so if you don't mind i'll just read a few lines love from it this. okay yes, please so this chapter is called diem perdidi she remembers her name She remembers the name of the president. She remembers the name of the president's dog. She remembers what town she lives in and on which street and in which house, the one with the big olive tree where the road takes a turn. She remembers what year it is. She remembers the season. She remembers the day on which you were born. She remembers the daughter who was born before you. She had your father's nose, but she does not remember that daughter's name. She remembers the name of the man she did not marry, Frank, and she keeps his letters in a drawer by her bed. She remembers that you once had a husband, but she refuses to remember your ex-husband's name. That man, she calls him. Anyway, so it goes on like that for a while. But what I started to think after I read it was, you could take that phrase, she remembers. And I know this has been in many other writing prompts and write in craft books and stuff, but just take it and use it however you want to like put, give it to one of your characters, give it to yourself, give it to, you know, if your characters in third person and you want to access it more closely, say, I remember, or I don't remember. I mean, this is particular to one person who has dementia. So the sentences are short and what she remembers is kind of basic, but I just, I think if you let yourself to have a kind of meditative phrase like that. It could also be a more emotional verb, like she loves or she hates, or she really can't stand. And just let yourself repeat that phrase and see what else comes out. So there's a certain magic to that repetition. And it's one of those things I think about a lot, but don't let myself do because I'm always, you know, must get the next scene written or whatever. But mm-hmm. I think I'm going to try that maybe today or tomorrow and play with that repetition and always coming back to she remembers, she remembers or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wonderful. I think that's awesome. Uh, something I've seen other, uh, I can't remember where I saw this, but I've used it in classes, but um, I've only ever used it once and not with the repetition idea, but um this idea of what I don't remember is. Oh, and isn't yes. that fascinating? Yes. And then like, once you get stuck, do it again. What I don't remember is there there's, there's mm-hmm. so many layers to that. Yes. So, Oh, thank you. That is beautiful. Oh. Oh, and it makes me you. want to go back to the book. I was, I, it was one of those where I, I downloaded the sample chapter. And then when I got done with the sample cha- or portion, I just wasn't sure if I wanted to push purchase, but you would suggest pushing purchase. Well, I think as a writer, so this, this is not like her other novels. So I, and it really doesn't have any real scenes in it. It's very hard to explain even what it is, but as a, as a writer to look at it and say like, what is she doing here? Like, this is a whole, Mm. you know, 50 pages of, of lists in a way, because it's like, um, it's really like nothing else I've, I've ever read, but it is, is, yeah, it's beautiful. And it is affecting like by the end, you're like, oh man. Um, so I don't, I don't know how she does it. Meanwhile, my dog is biting the puppy's biting my forearms. So stop, stop that. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> I so, and I, you know, I also say that as somebody, I'm kind of skeptical of prompts. Like when I have, I have a lot of books of writing prompts and when I yeah. try to do them, I'm just like, mm, no, it's not working. No, that one sounds really, really beautiful though. Incredibly beautiful. And I would love to know if uh, listeners try it, come let <laughs> us know, please. Um, may I ask you what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? So... Well, I mentioned the, um, the, the walking and I will say that yeah. walking is a big part of my writing practice and that, you know, when writing breakthroughs happen on a walk, I, I probably should not be surprised, but I always am. It's like, oh, right. And <laughs> it's like writing without trying to write or something. So there's that. And I guess the other thing that maybe this isn't really that surprising, but I, um, I find that music has an effect and mm -hmm. I'm not somebody who listens to music when I write. I, I generally like it to be quiet, but when I'm listening to music just in the kitchen or in the car, mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, certainly the music, like from our teen years, when you're in high school, that's mm -hmm. always going to have an emotional impact, but other music too, like of all kinds, and even music that I don't relate to that much can trigger something and make me want to sit down and write. So I don't how know. do you, how do you capture that feeling? Do you actually sit down and write or do you make a note on your phone or do you just feel it and try to hold on to it? Yeah, I think all of the above. I think it depends on what else is going on. And it could be, I could make, if I was out like on the trail or something, I could just make a note on my phone or um, in the car. I don't know what I would do, but um, yeah, it just, it just depends. And I have tried listening to music when I write. And I, I know some people have like a playlist just for writing but um, I, I tend to get a little distracted when I do that. I'm too distractible. If, it, if I, ha I have done it in the past, but it has to be music without words or in a language that I can't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I have been getting a lot from brain.fm, uh, brain if you've ever heard of that. I don't know. It's, uh, it uses the, oh, now I'm losing the, the word for what they do with the, the, the brain stimulation, basically, that they do, but it's, uh, oh, binaural uh, sounds. And so it's kind of, you okay. can, you can pick whether you're doing deep work or creativity, and then you can pick what, you know, do you want it to be um, lo-fi or do you want it to be classical? And then it kind of mushes it together and gives you um, something that does help your brain work better, they say. And it works well enough for me that I, I purchased a subscription within wow. a week of trying it okay. and I use it a lot. So okay. that's, that's brain FM. Kind of okay. nice. brain, yeah, yeah. Just Google brain FM and it'll, it'll come right up. Okay. Um, yeah. Who knows? It could be placebo, but placebo no, work. whatever it takes, right. Just to <laughs> trick your brain is, exactly. is the thing. Exactly. Yeah. What is the best book that you've read recently and why did you love it? Oh, so I, um, I have read a bunch of book, good books recently, but I will, um, talk a little bit about Emily St. John Mandel's new book Ooh. called Sea of Tranquility. And now she's the one who wrote, um, uh, Station Eleven. Correct. Of course. Yes. So she wrote Station Eleven and then she wrote The Glass Hotel. And if you are a reader who liked those books, you will really like Sea of Tranquility, um, so it's kind of, it, it is a time travel story and it ranges over 400 years, I think. So like it opens mm -hmm. in 1912 with a kind of um, feckless Canadian who's come to North America and it goes on through like the 2300s, I think. And then within it, there are a couple of time travelers who are moving in, in between. So it's it sounds like super wide ranging. Oh, and there's also like a pandemic novel within it. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. But it's kind of compact. I mean, it's not, a, I don't know if you read station 11, but that to me Did, felt yeah. like epic and yeah. not the hugest novel, but it felt like a big chunk of a novel. And this is kind of, it's not slim, but it's kind of, it's kind of compact. Anyway, it's um, beautiful. And her prose is just so beautiful but not fussy it never calls yeah. attention to itself and she's a really good plotter um but she's also just a really humane writer and it it just yeah it's very moving so oh, thank you yeah. that's flying flying to the top of my tbr list then i'd seen mm -hmm. it and i didn't i didn't know uh whether i should grab it or not i'm always in that should i should i um yes. so thank you well, when thank we you have for that. too many books that's a, yeah. it's such a good wonderful problem to have speaking mm -hmm. of wonderful books. Will you please tell us about your book? 
So my book is called The Wrong Kind of Woman, and it is kind of a campus novel. It's set in 1970. You had me um, at academic novel, honestly. I will always, <laughs> like if it's an academic novel at all, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. I love them too. But the people in the characters in this novel are sort of outsiders. It's not your usual campus novel. Mm -hmm. um, so it is set at a fictionalized Dartmouth college before Dartmouth went co-ed. And this college in the novel, Clarendon, is a lot like Animal House. It's all male, it's very waspy and jockey. And um, when my main character, Virginia, loses her husband really suddenly, and her husband, Oliver, was a history professor, she kind of has to like reassess everything. And she is muddling through and she starts to become friends with the four women faculty on campus. And those were women her husband really didn't like. So as she starts to become friends with them and see things through a different perspective, she um, begins to reevaluate everything. And they together start to bring change to their very traditional campus in small town and some hell breaks loose. <laughs> and um, she begins to reinvent herself. And then there are two other main characters, point of view characters who also um, are forced to reinvent themselves. And then for all of them, because it's 1970, there's the heavy pressure of the background, the background pressure of the Vietnam War and all the stuff that went along that with that. So the anti-war movement and the um, student strikes and protests and the women's movement becoming more um, visible nationally. And all of that has felt very far away for these characters until pretty recently. And now it's kind of here. So there's a, there was definitely, as I was reading it, this, you know, the, the prescient feeling of, holy crap, what's going on today, you know, in terms mm. of feminism and women's rights. And um, it was kind of just good to be there and, and watching it in your beautiful language. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I yeah. know it is weird how it's like, some things have changed a lot yeah. and some things have really not changed enough at all. At all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, where can we find you? So I would say mostly on Instagram. So I'm at Sarah McCraw Crow on Instagram and I'm occasionally on Twitter. I don't know what my Twitter thing is, but my, my website is just sarahmccrawcrow.com. So if you go there or just Google my name, the, the social media stuff will come up. I, something I want to point out for listeners that you just said too, is when I asked you where we could find you, you said mostly on Instagram, because that is obviously the social media platform that you enjoy the most. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm on Facebook, yep. but I like the bookish uh, people I encounter on, on Instagram yeah. and it's, yeah. you know, yeah. And so. you can be found. I really, I really think that as long as an author can be found somewhere, anywhere mm -hmm. doing the thing that you want to be doing, we don't have to worry so much about doing all of the things. So right. thank yes. you for saying that. Well, it has been a delight and a treat to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here and oh. all luck to you as the book flies from the shelves. Oh, thank you so much. It was really fun to talk to you. And I love, I love your podcast. It is, is a help to writers and readers. I love it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.